Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar with East Carolina University and Cornerstone On Demand. Refitting the ship, creating a culture of learning at ECU. My name is Rachel Rutherford, Marketing Strategist for Cornerstone On Demand, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Please note that this call is being recorded and all lines are muted. If you need help at any time, please send us a message via the chat box on the right side of the screen. If you do not see that chat box, click on the talk bubble icon at the bottom of your screen. Today's event will last up to 60 minutes. The question and answer segment will come at the end of the presentation. However, please queue up your questions throughout the event. Simply type them into the chat box on the right side of the screen and click send. Continuing education credit is available for this event. You must stay on for the entire event and complete the post event survey to receive your activity IDs, which will be delivered to you via email after the event. This program is available for one hour. There will be an archived recording of this event that will be available in the coming days. And now a little more information about Cornerstone On Demand. Cornerstone is a global human capital management leader with a core belief that institutions thrive when they help their employees to realize their potential. Putting this belief into practice, Cornerstone offers solutions to help institutions strategically manage and continuously develop their talent throughout the entire employee lifecycle. Featuring comprehensive recruiting, personalized learning, development-driven performance management, and holistic HR planning, Cornerstone's human capital management platform is successfully used by more than 3,400 global clients of all sizes, spanning over 38 million users across 192 countries and in 43 languages. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Before beginning at East Carolina University in 2016, Justin Yeaman spent 13 years in the automotive industry, with his last six years spent in the training department at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Currently serving as Director of Learning and Organizational Development in ECU's Human Resources Department, Justin oversees HR training initiatives at the UNC system's fourth largest institution, which employs roughly 6,000 faculty and staff. Outside of work, Justin is currently pursuing his EdD in educational leadership at ECU. Dan Blumberg currently serves as the Interim Assistant Vice Chancellor for Human Resources and Deputy Chief Human Resources Officer at East Carolina University. Dan joined ECU in February 2015 as the Director of HR Information Systems, providing leadership as the university's Chief HR Technology Officer. Prior to that, Dan held similar roles at Pima Community College and with Protivity, a private sector internal audit and technology consulting firm. Dan received a Master of Business Administration with a focus on business analytics from ECU and has an undergraduate degree in business administration with a focus on management information systems from the University of Arizona. Dan, the floor is all yours. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we appreciate you giving us a slice of your time this afternoon. So um, we'll just jump right into the content. And before we um, dig into uh, kind of going through our journey and explaining where we were and where we've been, um, as far as learning is concerned, we'll just give you a little bit of background about ECU for those of you that aren't familiar. And the image that you see on your screen is just a picture of our mall. It's one of the more um, recognizable features on our campus. So for those of you um, unfamiliar with ECU or the UNC system as a whole, we're part of a 17-member uh, group of constituent institutions in the state of North Carolina. Um, we have over 29,000 students, both graduate and undergraduate, and we are the fourth largest in the UNC system. So um, you probably recognize some of the, the um, big name schools, UNC Chapel Hill, NC State, uh, perhaps UNC Charlotte, and then um, ECU. We're located in Greenville, North Carolina, not to be confused with Greenville, South Carolina. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the, uh, the latter, not the former, you can see uh, we are in the eastern part of the state, about 90 minutes east of Raleigh. Uh, Greenville, South Carolina is closer to Charlotte, and folks often confuse the two. 
our university is comprised of eight distinct divisions. Um, we have a Division I athletics program, a Division of Academic Affairs, a Division of Health Sciences, uh, Administration and Finance, and, and other similar um, uh, breakdowns of business like you might expect. I think the important thing to highlight here uh, as we go through the content in this presentation is that we, we do have a medical campus. And so um, when we're talking about learning and, and talking about development, we had to uh, really keep in mind that we have a, a large variation in terms of, of the types of uh, faculty and staff that we um, are looking to instruct. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic off to Justin to give us a little bit of background. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, what you're seeing here, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with nautical terms and maybe unfamiliar with ECU and East Carolina University, our mascot is the Pirate. We're the ECU Pirates. And if you've ever had a chance to come to our town, you'll notice that pretty much everything is pirate themed from restaurants to what people wear to the events we have in town. So we thought it would only be fitting uh, to use uh, somewhat of a nautical theme for our presentation. Um, and anyone who's familiar with boating has probably heard the term to refit. Um, and we thought it'd be really fitting, uh, pun intended there, really fitting for us to use uh, refitting the ship as a title for our presentation, because around three years ago, when we began this journey, uh, we realized that our ship needed refitting. Um, you know, we were in decent shape, but it was time for us to pull into the dock and do a little bit of work on our professional development program here at ECU. Uh, so just so everyone knew where we were coming from with that, we thought it'd be nice to put the definition up there. So our presentation today has got several different um, parts to it. The first thing that we want to do is, is give you essentially a snapshot, a two-part snapshot of where we were essentially three years ago with regards to professional development, both um, with regards to our technology and also with regards to uh, the professional development programming we had here on campus. And since, as I'm sure um, most of you are familiar with the term, a picture says a thousand words, um, we thought it would be fun to, to illustrate that with a few images. So first, I'd like to give you a, a few images that really we feel like were representative of the perception of HR, perhaps, and especially our professional development programming that we had you know, in the past. So here's one right there um, that you know, a lot of people probably identified with us, uh, as well as sometimes maybe a little bit, uh, if any of you have ever noticed, uh, seen the movie Kindergarten Cop, um, that one's there for all of you office fans out there. Um, and lastly, it wouldn't be a presentation related to human resources if we didn't have a six-inch thick policy manual. Um, so really, uh, uh, for a lot of our learners, that was the perception that they had of, of human resources, and we'll get here in just a minute into the reasons for that perception. And we'll flip the coin a little bit and give you what we saw in the classroom when we looked out at those who were uh, often in attendance. These are some images that are representative of what we saw. We had a lot of learners who were uh, disengaged. Maybe they um, didn't feel like they were supposed to be there, constantly watching the time. Uh, and on a couple of occasions, we might would even see people lay their head down, uh, which is really surprising in higher education. We, we handled that as need be. So in addition to um, having an audience that was perhaps uh, less than engaged, we also were um, not where we wanted to be from a technology perspective. And so what you have on the screen here, um, obviously, is an abacus. And I kind of like to use this image to illustrate the idea of um, kind of how we felt about our technology and the tools that we were using to deliver this learning to people. Um, and, you know, if you think about um, doing some kind of math today, you think about a calculator, you think about a computer, but we were going back to the abacus, right? Um, in addition, you know, maybe instead of using a photo um, or a camera or, or some type of, uh, you know, it, um, uh, image modification technology, we were uh, relying on an Etch-a-Sketch to try and illustrate things to our folks. And um, for those of you that remember the uh, old, uh, you know, workstations that sat flat on your desk and, and had a three and a half inch floppy drive on them. Um, we were bringing people into, uh, you know, a modern institution and asking them to use technology that was 10, 15, 20 years old and asking them to get excited about it, which was a very, very tough sell, as you might imagine. So not only were we, um, you know, sort of tasked with dealing with 
um, the idea that we needed to re-energize and reinvigorate our learners to get them excited about this, but we also uh, needed to do some work on the infrastructure and business process side of things to make sure that we were giving them the tools that they needed to be successful. So um, next we're gonna talk a little bit deeper about some of the, the challenges that we had that created some of those issues with regards to our perceptions that learners may have had of, of us as a whole or our technology. Um, so professional development at ECU three years ago for a lot of our learners was viewed as punitive. Um, many times the training or learning opportunities that employees had was to remedy a deficiency that someone may have seen. Um, like for example, they had issues with interpersonal communication so their supervisor may mandate that they take some training class either in person or online that dealt with professional interpersonal communication. Uh, so as you can imagine, when, when learners um, don't feel like they have a choice in the type of learning that they receive, oftentimes they're going to be uh, feeling captive or unwilling. So you, as most of you are, who are involved in learning and professional development, if you have a group of people who don't want to be in uh, a workshop or don't want to be uh, engaging online, you're less likely to have willing and, and engaged and happy learners uh, so that's what we were seeing was a lot of captive and, and unwilling learners. Um, on the flip side, you know, in-house, we had some challenges because as a group, we had um, very little clear direction. Our uh, unit, Learning and Organizational Development, we did have a strategic plan that had been created about um, three or four years prior, but due to some leadership changes and some personnel turnover, um, nothing had really uh, taken shape out of it, and as a lot of you have probably experienced or seen at, at your institutions or your workplaces, sometimes great ideas, if not picked up and ran with, uh, tend to get dropped or they get moved to the back burner as other priorities uh, take take their place. And that was a lot of what, what we had saw because we didn't have necessarily a strategic individual in place to push things forward. And to top it all off, um, something that you all have probably experienced at some point in time. We also had limited resources, uh, of course, without getting too deep into it. Uh, of course, we, like many other institutions out there uh, that are in the same shape, you know, we had a limited, limited financial budgetary resources um, as well as limited human resources. And that's really what I want to focus on for the next minute or so is just to kind of give you an image of um, our situation with regards to human resources uh, within learning and organizational development and the responsibilities that our team had. Uh, so here you go, what you're seeing in front of you right there is uh, an organizational chart for our entire university. Our entire university is comprised, uh, this may not be an accurate number today because it fluctuates from day to day, um, but of 6,000, roughly 6,254 employees. Uh, so you can just say 6,200 employees. For those employees, we've got two groups who are charged uh, with pro, uh, the majority of professional development for those two groups. Uh, to your left, you see the Office for Faculty Excellence and also Learning and Organizational Development. The Office for Faculty, faculty Excellence is, is charged with, uh, as you could probably tell by their title, uh, ensuring excellence in faculty. So they spend a lot of time um, trying to move the move the needle with regards to faculty engagement, as well as um, teaching online instruction, universal design for learning, uh, how to use Blackboard, things like that. This is an org chart representative of the Office for Faculty Excellence. They've got, I believe, uh, seven employees um, there to ensure the you know, promotion of faculty excellence here on campus, and they have roughly 1,900 faculty that they have to, uh, they're charged with um, on campus, and that's including a part-time adjunct, tenure-track and non-tenure-track faculty. That's all of, our, all of our faculty, including clinical faculty as well for our health sciences side. On the flip side, if you look at learning and organizational development, we've got uh, the rest of our staff here uh, on campus, the roughly a little over 4,000 employees, and I'm gonna show you now our organizational chart for learning and organizational development. There we are. Um, it's, it's currently, uh, we're slated for three FTE. Um, myself serving as a, a director of learning and organizational development. 
We're currently in a search for uh, learning and organizational development consultant. And to the right there, you see um, one of our most beloved employees here at ECU, Christy Carraway, who's our training specialist. Um, and so essentially what you've got is um, currently two, but in the future you're gonna have three employees charged with you know, servicing the learning and organizational needs, HR related, um, to almost uh, two thirds of a university. On top of all that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan here. He's gonna talk to you a little bit about our, our processes and uh, LMS. So to kind of compound matters a little bit, not only um, were we as an institution institution asking Justin and his staff to do a whole lot more with less, um, we also weren't able to say to him, hey, um, you know, not only are we asking you to do more with less, but here are some really great tools and some really good, great resources to help you uh, in that uh, in that endeavor. And so, um, you know, in a lot of respects, when Justin and I first started talking about kind of how to turn the tide on this a couple of years ago, um, we realized very quickly that a two-pronged approach was going to be necessary, and in some respects, we had to divide and conquer. And so while Justin's team kind of ran um, with the personnel side of things, um, me and my team uh, at the time, I was still uh, solely in the director of HRS role, we kind of took a look at the underlying infrastructure and saw um, opportunities to make some improvements there. So I just kind of want to highlight one example because, um, and I'm not sure how, how prevalent this uh, kind of thing may be at your institution, but inevitably uh, every institution has some nuance about uh, the way that they do business that, that can create challenges in one way or another. Maybe it's the way you all manage your books or maybe it's the way you all um, code something a particular way in the system that create challenges down the road. But there were some very basic things about the infrastructure here at ECU that made learning and organizational development very challenging. Um, so what you see in front of you is, is what all of you, I'm sure, recognize as an org chart, right? You have some basic, uh, basic hierarchy there. You have a position number uh, and a title, and then you have a person seated in the position, HR 101, right? Um, when we first got to ECU, both Justin and I realized we were working with this. So what you see on the screen is actually kind of a, um, and, and I guess the only way I can describe it is really just an off-base use of our banner ERP system and the way that we uh, had elected to code positions and jobs and other things in our payroll system. So really what we uh, were working with was a, a, an HR system that was largely set up and designed to support finance needs only, whereby all of our positions at the university were set up like little pools of money. And what ended up happening over time as faculty members or deans or other people in the, uh, in the university changed funding sources, rather than moving the money around, we moved the people around to where the money was. And the result of that was what you see on the screen. You had multiple people in multiple positions, and sometimes you had the same people overlapping in the same positions. And you all might be wondering, well, why is that important for learning and organizational development? Um, but, you know, just think about this. How do you identify who the true supervisor is in this relationship, right? You can't. So we weren't in a position where we could have somebody log into a learning management system and actually see the people that they support or the people that they oversee or the people in their department. Um, so this kind of basic concept of I as a supervisor need to be able to identify the people that report to me, see what kind of training they've taken at the university, be able to assign them training, um, figure out what kinds of content we have out there and what might be useful for the team. We didn't have any way of, of giving that to somebody in an easy format. Um, really the only way that folks knew who reported to whom was to go out to the department and kind of really talk about it. And as you might imagine, uh, you know, being an institution as large as we are, uh, we can't be doing that every single day. So we had some cleanup work to do here. In addition to that, this is what our LMS looked like. Um, keep in mind that this is the experience that our users got as recently as five years ago. So um, if you're kind of wondering what you're looking at or if this does seem familiar to you, I have a, another image that might uh, give you some clarity as to why that's familiar. Um, for those of you who don't know what this is, that is MySpace, the social network that people haven't used in the better part of a decade. The reason that I put that up there is that these two um, pieces of technology were actually built on the same underlying code. So 
uh, a piece of software that hasn't been used in 10 years and really just sort of um, not only hasn't been used but has been legacy for a long time before that was what we built our learning management system on. It was homegrown, but it was very, very basic. And so not only were we asking people to come in and, and take training and develop professionally in a setting that they felt was punitive, but then we put something like this in front of them. You know, very, very difficult to get uh, excited about that. So I'm going to turn it back over to Justin to kind of describe um, how we went from where we were uh, to where we are today. Yeah, and Dan, I think you make a, a really great point that uh, you know not only did, did a lot of our learners feel like you know, learning at the university was sometimes a punitive measure, but not only was it punitive, we also made it difficult to, difficult for them to access that learning. Um, so you know, how did we get to where we are today? Uh, so. For, for those of you who are, are familiar uh, with learning and organizational development, which is probably most people out there, uh, one of the first things you have to do when trying to uh, turn, turn the ship around, right the ship, turn the tide, or what have you, uh, is you have to figure out what your employees actually want and what they need. Um, so we took a couple different steps to do that. Um, one of them was through um, formal uh, learning and organizational development uh, needs assessment. Uh, it was a you know, fairly extensive but not overly burdensome uh, needs assessment that we sent out uh, to the entire university uh, shortly after we began this process just to try to get a gauge of what were the skills that people felt like they were lacking? What were the topics that people would enjoy learning about? What were the, the ways in which people wanted to learn? Did people uh, prefer face-to-face -face methods? Did people prefer online, a hybrid method? Um, what did they want with regards to that? And also a lot of simple questions like, what's the easiest day of the week for you to attend a training event? And we learned uh, really quickly two things. Um, no one wanted to do training on Monday, and no one wanted to come to a training event on Friday afternoons uh, because a lot of people we're trying to leave work on Friday afternoon, and that, that's completely understandable. So we ask questions like that, you know, when can you come to training? What time of day is best for you? Um, so we, we asked a lot of questions to try to figure out not only what people wanted and what they needed, but also how to make it easiest for them to attend or access the learning. Uh, the other way that we did it was through informal measures. Um, you know, we already had in place, and we were very lucky, uh, that we had in place certification programs uh, related to uh, administrators or supervisors or leave clerks, people who worked in the medical fields, uh, where they had to take a, a curriculum of face-to-face you know, -face training related to policies, procedures, and stuff like that to get certified in whatever that area was. And what we started doing was uh, saving five or ten minutes at the end of those training sessions just to have an informal uh, focus group or what have you to talk to them uh, since they were there and they were kind of a captive audience anyway, to talk to them about what it is that they would like to get out of a professional development program. Uh, and we learned a lot of really interesting stuff from uh, people through both of those measure measures. Um, mostly what we learned is that we needed to do a better job of engaging with our supervisors and those who were um, you know, leading other people. So we knew, okay, this is what they wanted, soft skills, essentially related to leadership and some other um, policy areas. So obviously there's two of us uh, in learning and organizational development. We don't have the expertise or subject matter expertise in all the areas. Um, so we had to do, we had to enlist some help. So um, one good thing about working in human resources is you meet a lot of people because you're, you're out talking with different areas, doing consultations or, or what have you. And we met a lot of people who we could enlist for help, and these are just three represented right here. Uh, one is an uh, employee relations consultant that we work very closely with. Another person works in our campus rec and wellness department. Uh, he does a great job teaching a lot of soft skills related to work-life balance, stress management. And uh, of course, where would we be without our uh, beloved faculty? Uh, at the bottom, we've got a member of our faculty from our School of Communication uh, who taught a lot of classes for us on professional communication. So once we figured out what we needed, who we could get to help us, we started developing new programming. And, and here are just a few examples of some of the things that we, we did. 
Um, the first one you saw there was uh, a leadership development program. Every month now, from the beginning of this project, after we developed out our uh, programming, we hold a uh, twice a month training session for any of our leadership or actually anyone who's interested in these topics to come and learn more about um, whatever soft skill we have on the docket that month, whether it be uh, managing generation gaps in the workplace, uh, intrinsic motivation for employees, uh, professional communication. It, it, there's a, you know, a, a spectrum of things that we talk about. We've got book clubs, and uh, one of my favorite things, at least one that has, I think, the best title, was one of the lunch and learns that we began developing uh, where our uh, ADA coordinator brought in uh, a visually impaired student to help us learn about um, what life was like with a service animal. Uh, and that was really impactful for a lot of those, you know, everyone who was in attendance. So these are all programs that were stemming from that needs assessment. These are things that people said, this is what we want. And we began to give them what they wanted. One of the best things I think we did was to begin generating interest on campus before we actually rolled all of our programming out. Uh, and we did it a lot like the film industry. Uh, we'd send teaser emails out to campus saying things like, you know, we're be expecting new things from learning and organizational development. Um, there's some training coming down the road. We're not necessarily going to tell you what all of it is, but we're going to tease you a little bit with it. And people, you know, they were started to, to generate a little bit of buzz on campus. So we didn't necessarily put up posters that said, you know, Marvel Studios presents Thor, but I really wanted to put up posters like this that said, Dan, coming to a conference room near you. Um, so uh, uh, I'd like to say that um, that was just a joke, but Justin has uh, actually made a poster um, and it has been uh, quite well received. So, I, I, and I think really um, all kidding aside, that's kind of the thing that's, that's really sort of different from what our employees were used to seeing in the past, right? Um, so, you know, Justin was going out and, and doing things to kind of re-peak that interest to get folks that had been sort of um, maybe given up on, on learning and maybe had decided that ECU was not going to be the place for them to do that. And all of a sudden they're saying, hey, this is something different. This is something that I've not seen before. I'd like to see what they have to offer. Um, where I sort of came into play at that point is we knew that we had to deliver, right? We couldn't put out a movie poster. Um, you know, something like Thor, get people very excited and then bring them in and show them the MySpace of the LMS, right? We had to really, really have something uh, for them that was, uh, for lack of a better word, shiny, but, but really exciting for them to use, something that was easy, something that was intuitive, something that showed them things that they hadn't seen before. And so in order to do that, we really had to kind of go back to basics and retool our systems and retool our processes. So the first step, right, and I'm just going to continue on the example I gave earlier, was to clean up sort of the basic underlying data that we had in our ERP system that was preventing us from, from implementing a, a cutting-edge uh, LMS like Cornerstone. Um, we had to basically clean up our position structure, right? We had to get away from using our HR system to meet a finance need. And, um, you know, what that really looks like visually is we had to get all these erroneous people out of these positions and get back to a one-person, one-position model so that we could identify some of those basic things like supervisory relationships. While that might sound really simple on the surface, um, I can tell you it was far from it. We're a big university with a lot of different offices that have a lot of different business needs um, and a lot of different opinions about how things should be done. And so I, I throw this up there to highlight how um, important change management is because if you all at your respective institutions are in a similar position, laying the groundwork and getting people excited and giving them the opportunity to provide input about how to change the way that you're doing business is the only way that you're going to be successful. And what that really looked like for us, and, and this is just an example of, of um, one piece of, of this initiative, but you're looking at a process map, right? And so this kind of resulted from a three-day internal workshop where we brought in some consultants sat all of the players in a room and said, okay, how do we do X, right? Let's think about the way that we're conducting business now, keeping in mind that our end goal is this kind of one person, one position model, and how do we get there, right? So um, for those of you that haven't been involved in a, a uh, business process analysis workshop before, there's kind of this, this procedure where you, you take a look at what you're doing, you design um, what you want to be doing or an ideal process, uh, and then you um, basically develop a project plan to make that make those things happen, and that's what you're looking at here. Um, 
this particular uh, process map happened to be about um, onboarding, and it ended up being one or two pages long, but we had scaled that down from something that was like a, a 10 or 11-page, uh, very convoluted, very duplicative onboarding process where um, folks were doing things multiple times. And it was the same kind of scenario with, um, with our position budgeting and, and uh, the reason that we had multiple people in multiple positions. So um, again, just kind of uh, not losing sight of the idea that sometimes you really have to get under the hood and realize where your, your stumbling blocks are going to be because at the surface level, right, this doesn't look anything uh, related to learning and organizational development. But as we kind of walk the thing all the way through, we found out that it was going to basically make or break our initiative. So some things that we learned throughout that process, we were able to um, successfully identify over a thousand supervisors across our eight divisions, and we now have that information at our fingertips, something that took us weeks and weeks to compile before and often was uh, ripe with errors. Um, we were able to identify 10 different organizational layers, depending on business unit. What I mean by that is uh, layers in between the chancellor of our university and the person at the entry level. So if you think about that, right, a business unit that has two or three levels between top leadership um, and entry-level employees, um, the training strategy for a department like that is very different than a, than a department that may um, not only be part of, you know, ECU as a whole and then have a college level or a division level and then a college level and then perhaps on the clinical side, uh, maybe something like the Department of Pediatrics and then a bunch of individual business units within that. The training uh, strategies or, or the approaches that you need in order to be effective, they're very, very different. So it helped us better target our audience. Um, we were able to eliminate 2,500 shell positions, which basically meant um, we had 2,500 positions in our system that at the surface level thought, hey, maybe we need to think about, um, you know, developing a, a training strategy for this particular classification and, and things like that. So we were able to, again, sort of better isolate what we were working with and where we needed to uh, direct our efforts. And we were able to um, basically create a, a single system of record for these supervisory relationships, which not only do we now use in, in the LMS, but also uh, in a number of our other auxiliary systems. Okay, so we're going to give you a little bit of information about where we are now. Um, so we've been riding this ship for um, really in earnest for about two and a half years now and really making a strong, concerted effort to change the learning culture here at ECU. And, and here are some of the things that we've really started noticing. Um, one of the most impactful ones is captive learners and people who viewed training and development as punitive are becoming willing learners. Uh, the same people who you would see in the back of a classroom uh, playing on their cell phone or answering emails, these are people that are sitting, uh, they're not on the front row, but they're in the middle of the classroom and they're actually engaging in the learning opportunity and we're seeing some, some measurable impacts um, you know, around those, one of those measurables is our attendance at uh, our uh, development opportunities. You know, our voluntary attendance has increased approximately 20 times uh, in the first, really in the first year of this um, you know, program where we've been trying to change things, it's increased approximately times 20. Uh, some other figures for you here, if you remember very briefly um, the monthly leadership series where we would do uh, pretty much two leadership series, leadership skills, soft skills trainings uh, a month. In the first 12 months of that, we had approximately 500 different employees uh, on a voluntary basis attend at least one of our offerings. Uh, of those 500, around 250 of them were supervisors. Uh, so you know, to Dan's data, we said we identified approximately a thousand people in leadership, a quarter of them voluntarily left their office, came to a two hour, at least one two hour workshop to learn something about how to better do their jobs. Um, going from you know almost zero of that to you know 250, I think that's a pretty impressive number for us. Um, something that, that I'm really excited about is we've seen a dramatic increase in our content as far as the um, variety of offerings that we're able to provide and our subject matter expertise. Um, while we've enlisted the help of lots of subject matter experts across campus at the same time, we've you know, we run into some roadblocks. You know, you may experience this at your institution where 
there's a, a topic that you want to cover or there's an assessment that you want done um, where the only person on your campus that has that skill set or has the certification to do so um, may be someone in a, in a faculty position who's not a, either not able to um, come out and teach a workshop or they may be in a situation where they want to, to charge an honorarium to do so and you don't necessarily have the funding to do it. Um, so in those cases, what, what we did is we would build out the, the training ourselves. You know, personally, I spent hours upon hours you know, reading journal articles, reading best practices, attending other training, um, anything like that to try to increase my expertise so I could build out a meaningful offering for people here on campus. From a systems perspective, um, where we're at now, uh, you know, it, just to kind of show you visually, is we were successful in moving to that kind of one person, one position model, and we were able to generate enough interest in it through some of the groundwork that we laid through those workshops to get it done in under three months. Um, so the org chart that you see there on the right is now very representative of, of what we have here at ECU. Um, it, required involvement from every single division. Everybody bought in, which was very, very exciting because we were able to help them understand why it was important and what it could mean at the end of the day for them. Um, in that three-month time, we processed over 5,000 personnel and position actions to get all of that taken care of, which for those of you um, who may be involved in the HRS side of things, you know that's no small feat, particularly when you're thinking about payroll. Um, and we were able to ultimately deliver on this. So for those of you that um, uh, you know, are Cornerstone customers, you, you're familiar with this, right? This is what um, you know, a manager can go into the system and see. And, and this is a very simple example, but um, what you're really looking at is, is all of a sudden we've been able to deliver a dashboard or a heads up display to our employees where a manager can log in, basically look at the people that he or she supervises there on the left and have insight into what those people have been doing, right? What training have they taken? What training do they plan to take? They have the ability as a manager to assign them training if they want them. Maybe you need somebody to take a class on business writing, or maybe you need somebody to, um, you know, who's a new supervisor and you want them to um, maybe start building out their soft skills. Maybe you want to leave them a comment and some kudos, um, or maybe that particular employee just wants to go out there and put some stuff on their profile to find their interest, whatever it might be. Um, but this is something that they didn't have before. So again, kind of going back to that whole, we were able to tease them and kind of get them excited. When they showed up in class, all of a sudden, we were able to show them something shiny, something cool, something that they um, were able to use and be excited about that they'd never seen before he, at ECU. And, and many of them probably had sort of written off as ever being a possibility. In addition, um, now that folks were getting more engaged, we were seeing more traffic in the system, we were able to sort of branch out a little bit and, and um, expand the offerings that we had. Justin talked about a little bit earlier the idea of developing content um, internally and kind of learning as we go. We were also able to start putting on some internal conferences and market them in a way that, um, that folks hadn't seen before. We were able to say, hey, you want to learn more about uh, talent management initiatives at ECU? Um, you know, come to the Heart Center for these two days and you can take these individual trainings. Um, we were able to record them, put versions of them in Cornerstone, um, and give people credit for all of these kinds of things that they, they hadn't been able to do before. And, and it sort of caught fire. On the left-hand side, you see one that um, was specific to HR, but we recently upgraded our banner system from version 8 to version 9, and our ITCS folks, um, Information Technology and Computing Services, saw that and said, hey, we, we want to you know, help us do what you did, right? So now all of a sudden it's, it's turned into a little bit like a snowball where um, we were able to get enough interest at the beginning uh, that word is starting to spread and people are really, really getting, getting excited about learning, which is just core to everything that we're doing. They are willing to use the system. They're willing to come to trainings. They pay attention when our emails and announcements come out um, and that just builds over time. And um, to kind of piggyback a little bit on what, what Dan was saying uh, before I talk about what you see in front of you, um, his comment about other departments coming to us, for example, our, our IT department, and saying, help us do what you did, uh, years ago that wasn't the case. Uh, and I think something that, that really is indicative of is the fact that you know, HR is no longer necessarily being seen as the policy police. We're now being seen more as a strategic partner here in a lot of our university-wide or enterprise-wide initiatives, if we've got IT or other departments coming to, an, to us asking us to work at, at a consultant level to help them do some of the same things that we've been doing. Um, but anyway, you know, my, one of my favorite things uh, to do as, uh, as a trainer is to hear feedback from our learning sessions and our opportunities. And these are just some of the, 
anecdotal evidence, some of the things that, that we've seen in our uh, surveys and some of the conversations that we've had with people, the comments that they've made, the, what they've taken away and been able to apply to their um, positions. Um, to me, to a lot of people, those are, those are just comments about what people have learned, but to me, this represents behavior change. Uh, and it's the, the, what we want to do, our main goal in learning is to help people change their behavior for the better. And I think really this is, this is what that represents. So of course, and we're, we're getting, uh, getting close to the end here uh, of our presentation, but we feel like we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about where we were headed um, because we can't just stop here. You know, we are uh, in pretty good shape, but there are still some things that, that need to be done. There will always things uh, that will need to be done at, at any institution. So I just want to share with you some of the things that we uh, predict that we're, we've got in flight now to try uh, to complete here in the future. Uh, now, before a, a lot of you get, get worried here, I know for a lot of institutions, uh, especially some state institutions, when they see the word secession planning, everyone gets a little bit nervous and you say, well, we can't do secession planning, that's against the law. Um, that's not the type of secession planning I'm talking about. We're definitely not talking about implementing any pre-selection or anything like that. Um, we're talking about here identifying ways to identify um, high potential employees to try to uh, put resources into that employee to build them out to their fullest potential and maybe build a, a bench for our future leadership. Um, we've got some interesting things that are really starting to boil up now related to uh, individual development plans and stuff like that and that we hope to be rolling out in 2019. Um, we've, we've really started scratching the surface with leadership development at this point. Um, but I think we've got a lot more that we could do. Uh, there's a lot of leaders that we're not impacting uh, right now. So one of the things that I'm planning or at least hoping to do uh, is to in implement a multi-day uh, training offering for new supervisors. Because in a lot of our institutions, what we do is we identify someone who's really good at their job. Uh, so we may make them the leader of other people who do that same job. Uh, and then essentially what we do is we make them a supervisor, but we don't give them the skills to supervise. Uh, so a lot of new supervisors out there are falling through the cracks. So we're planning on implementing some much more robust leadership development offerings, uh, along with a completely revamped and renovated first year experience. Uh, it's not enough to provide learning opportunities um, to people who have been here for a while or people who've you know, moved into leadership positions but I think we need to do a better job of engaging our employees from their first day through their first year. I mean, because you know, what they say is the first um, little bit of time at an employer is when, it is when a person is going to decide whether or not they're going to stay there. Um, so we're planning on completely revamping that, uh, as well as taking advantage of some of Cornerstone's new technological offerings, uh, such as our Learner Home, which you see right here, uh, is just a small screenshot of some of the things that we can do with our learning management system that we're planning on rolling out in the future. For example, we'll be able to curate online modules based on prior selections. Uh, so people will actually be able to create playlists based off of what they want, you know, they're, what they're interested in. Uh, so for example, you may have a supervisor, uh, Dan may say, okay, Justin, uh, you need to learn a little bit more about your uh, skills with Microsoft Excel. So I'm going to assign you this playlist. I want you to complete all these trainings on Excel. They're curated in one spot, so I don't have to go out and search all over the place for them. Uh, so I think that we're really excited about that because all it's going to do is make the online learning experience even easier uh, for our employees. And I think from, from a technology perspective, and this will, will take us across the finish line here, um, one of the great things about um, having a, a, a technology infrastructure that's sound and robust is that you can um, do a lot with the information and the data that's generated by those systems. And so you may be asking, why do we have a magic eight ball on here? Um, but it's kind of a little bit of a joke. You know, people want to know how something is going to play out. They want to see um, maybe what's going to happen in the future. So they go to the magic eight ball and the magic eight ball gives them a very vague answer. And without good data, that's really the best you can do. You're just taking a guess. Um, 
But with all of the data that we've now been able to generate and that we can go through and analyze, we're actually able to, um, to start doing some very basic predictive analytics. And part of the roadmap would be to analyze the trainings that we're offering, see what kinds of employees are taking them, and figure out how to better suggest to employees training that we think maybe they might be interested in. I'm sure all of you, um, you may be doing your, uh, your holiday shopping these days, and um, you go out to Google and, and you go to a website and somehow, like magic, all of the things that you have recently been interested in are displayed and advertised on the right-hand side of your page. Um, that's predictive analytics, right? Really all that is is looking at a giant data set and trying to suggest to the user something that they might be interested in, and we aim to take that same kind of approach here at ECU. Um, so let's say that, um, just to give you kind of a quick example, um, we noticed that over the last year we have a history of our um, business officers going to a particular training, and we noticed that we have this other subset of the business officers, employees in the same classification that haven't taken that training. Well, based on the fact that it seems to be very popular amongst some of the others, we can offer that up, right, or give them a tickler that it might be something that they're interested in. So um, just kind of a little preview of what we hope to do with some of this in the future, um, start doing a little bit more um, proactive suggestion as opposed to reactive suggestion and continuing to um, find ways to get people engaged um, and excited. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn uh, back over to you, Rachel, to curate our Q&A session. Great. Thank you, guys. So it is now time for the Q&A segment. Um, if you have additional questions, please feel free to type it into the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen, um, and I will be checking those. Um, I do have a few queued up for you guys already. Uh, the first question I have, uh, to what areas of the college does the Office of Faculty, um, sorry, the Office of Faculty Excellence report? Um, the Office of Faculty Excellence reports up uh, to our provost, our chief academic officer, through our Division of Academic Affairs. So they're, okay. they're a uh, completely separate division than us. Okay. And what is the reporting structure of your learning and or development department? Um, sure. Um, so currently, you know, under me, I have two positions reporting to me, an HR consultant um, for whom we're currently uh, in a search, and a training specialist. Um, then I'm the director of learning and organizational development, and I currently report to our Associate Vice Chancellor of Human Resources and Chief Human Resources Officer, um, Kitty Weatherington, who reports to our Vice Chancellor of Administration and Finance, who reports to our Chancellor. I don't know if you wanted okay, me to go that topic. far up, but we take it to the top. <laughs> Might as well. Um, in order to support the 5,000 personnel actions in three months, what sort of support did you have from your HR generalists, and what does that side of your organization look like? We bought 1,000 pizzas and bribed everybody to come sit in rooms with us. No, I, and so I, I say that a little bit in just a kind of not, so that's a great question. Um, we really had to excite our generalists to help, but we also had to excite people who didn't necessarily work in our division who could help us understand some of what um, the actual business looked like. So we have a very decentralized model here at ECU. So yes, we needed to get our central HR generalists involved, but we also needed to get um, representation um, from uh, you know, folks out there at, at individual colleges or, or business units or whatever to do those things. And really the only shared supervisor we had was, was our chancellor. And so there was a degree of, we know this is gonna be a lot of work, but for those of us in leadership, we made a very conscious decision at the beginning that, hey, we were gonna get down in the trenches. And I was right there sitting processing personnel transactions on a Saturday with a bunch of um, you know, folks that I'd never worked with before. And I quite literally did bring in pizzas. Um, and then, of course, you know, afterwards, I think with any change management initiative, um, getting down in the trenches is good, helping them understand why it's important is good, why it's good for the institution. But then we made sure that we celebrated our successes afterwards. And so we had a little powwow. We got everybody together where we um, sort of, you know, demonstrated what had been accomplished, how, um, you know, how important it was to the institution, what we'd be doing it. And, of course, at that, we, we fed people also. Food is a really, really good motivator. Dan, you're a very good motivator. I don't know Can you come it. in like a wrecking ball like that? <laughs> All right. Um, uh, how did you get the finance people to agree to spending the necessary funds to implement the solution? 
So that's um, a really great question. Um, and I won't say that we ever got them nearly as excited about the folks in, on the HR side, but we were able to, um, it really what it boiled down to is not so much spending the money, but understanding what their needs were and helping them understand how in this new model, their needs were still going to be met. And so changing all of the, um, you know, basically changing the way that we did business and that we were managing position budgets didn't have a tangible cost in the sense that we weren't going out and buying a new system to do it, um, but it did take a pretty significant retraining effort. We had to work with our um, information technology and computing services folks to help um, adjust the, the financial modules of our ERP system a little bit to, um, to kind of uh, account for the new model and things like that. And, and again, I, I can't say that, um, you know, everybody ever got as excited as some of the HR folks did, but really um, having a very uh, concentrated effort on change management and helping them understand, again, why it's important and why um, the institution is going to be better off because of this really, I think, was key to success on that front. Okay, fantastic. Um, and another one, um, what type of professional development does ECU offer for diversity and inclusion? Yeah, sure, that's a great question. Um, we're very fortunate uh, here at ECU to have an Office for Equity and Diversity, uh, or as you may hear it called, uh, OED, uh, and they offer a very robust uh, professional development programming um, for equity and diversity here on campus. Just to highlight a, a couple things that they do and some of the things that you may be familiar with is um, the safe zone training, um, for employees to get certified to be, for their, their workspace to be a safe zone. Um, for those who um, may be representing the LGBTQ community who um, may feel bullied or feel mistreated where they can come and, and feel safe and secure in a workspace and have someone who can really be an ally for them. Uh, also offer a green zone training, which is a very similar thing uh, for veterans that feel like they need some support so people can come into those offices as well. Um, we do a lot of allyship training um, for those in marginalized communities, as well as um, we have, um, for example, affinity groups where people from those different uh, communities can come together and learn more about themselves, learn more about others, and just really generate a sense of community here on campus, um, which is something that we've learned, especially for uh, students, which I know we're talking about staff and faculty here, but we've really learned that for students, and I think it also goes uh, for faculty and staff, especially those who move here from other areas, uh, it's very important to establish a sense of community on campus that's uh, it's critical for success for students. And I think personally, it's critical for success and retention of employees. Okay. And how did the HR Learning and Development Group announce or communicate the LMS change to learners once Cornerstone was implemented? Yeah, so um, we, we actually probably did not do that in a way that um, was, was as, we learned a lot from that, um, I'll put it that way. So we, we did some email blasts, we did some announcements on our website. Um, I think where we dropped the ball or maybe learned something a little bit there is when we announced the LMS, um, we sort of assumed that it was so shiny and so nice that people would just kind of flock to it more naturally than they did. Um, and I think what we failed to do was kind of have that dialogue. And, and what we learned a little bit after the launch and weren't seeing um, you know, maybe the, the uh, percentages of the uptick in users and things like that that we would have liked is we started having more in-person conversations, you know, um, we'd asked if we could go uh, to a dean's meeting, right, and talk to all the deans about this new tool that they, that they had because, um, you know, they may not have had an opportunity or the time to really digest a, an email and read through all the pieces and parts and play around with it. Um, themselves, but having that dialogue and explaining sort of that bigger picture is really where I think we saw the most juice for our squeeze because those deans or those directors or whomever then in turn went back to their employees and said, hey, I just heard about something really cool from HR. Take a look at this. Let me know what you think. Share it with your people. And so um, definitely don't discount word of mouth when you're thinking about how to announce these kinds of things. And um, just to, to kind of jump on that a little bit, we are uh, going to be introducing our learner home here at ECU which is a, a fairly new component of Cornerstone. If we have any Cornerstone customers out there, you may have already rolled it out. Um, but essentially what it is, it's a, it's a new fresh landing page for your users 
Um, when they log into the system, where it looks, I think it's modeled off of something like Netflix or Spotify or something that's really familiar. Um, for us, we, it seems like it's a, a naturally intuitive thing, but for some of our users, we're sure it's going to be, you know, any change is change, and it's change that has to be dealt with. Uh, so this time around, based off of the, the things that we learned the first time, um, we're going to take a different approach in easing our people into um, using this new landing page by first communicating to campus that it's coming, giving them um, small snippets of information, and then providing multiple means of learning for them to uh, engage with that new uh, learner home, being knowledgeable that not everybody learns a new system the same way. So we're going to be creating uh, paper, well, maybe not paper, but PDF job aids so people can learn all the different functions, as well as providing uh, screen capture, online training available through our website and through Cornerstone. Uh, and we're also planning on most likely holding some in-person training in town hall meetings just to give people the opportunity to come to us, see it live, and ask questions. Uh, kind of to speak to Dan's point, you can't overlook word of mouth and that face-to-face -face dialogue. Great. Um, what other non-HR trainings are hosted on the LMS, if any? We actually, uh, very recently, if anyone out there is familiar with lynda.com here at ECU. We have a contract with Lynda. We're very grateful for the fact that we were able to integrate lynda.com with our uh, Cornerstone LMS. And if you're not familiar with Lynda, pretty much what it is, it's a library of online training content that um, it really runs the spectrum from, say, professional communication to how to use Microsoft Access or Excel, or how to have a difficult conversation, or learning more about the Americans with Disabilities Act, or, or anything. Um, so when we were able to integrate them with Cornerstone, we added, a, I think it's an additional 6,000 online modules where uh, are available to people. Outside of that, we've got a lot of um, particular subject matter areas who house training on Cornerstone as well. Just to give you uh, a couple examples, our information security team, they house online training related to information security that every new employee has to take and retake um, biannually, I believe. Um, our Office for Equity and Diversity houses a lot of their online, well, pretty much all of their online content for staff and faculty on Cornerstone. Our Office for Research Integrity, or excuse me, you know, Institutional Integrity houses uh, HIPAA training for our healthcare providers or anyone who's handling protected health information, which is mandatory. Our Registrar's Office houses training on FERPA uh, for those dealing with student records. Uh, it's really it's a myriad of different things that we uh, have housed on there, in addition to HR training and the lynda.com. So. Okay, great. Looks like we have time for uh, one more question. Um, what is your ideal team size and what roles would be included? Uh, is that question for Justin or Dan? I, frankly, Dan, I probably think it's both of you. So if either of you would like to tackle that one, that would be fine. Sure, I'll I'll I'll, I'll jump in first. Uh, for me, um, my ideal size for LNOD, and it's something that I've given quite a bit of thought to. Um, you know, right now we're uh, we're about to hopefully about to hire our HR consultant, which according to our org chart would have us fully staffed with me and two direct reports. Um, but I think uh, ideally, and hopefully in the future this will come true, um, our uh, size in LNOD would probably be uh, myself plus a consultant to handle some of the higher level issues and at least two to three training specialists to act as my um, both back of the house cornerstone administrator and probably two people to be boots on the ground delivering face-to-face -face training at, at every opportunity. And I think from my perspective, and I'll probably take this to the end here, is um, that, that question really, I think, has to be answered in context, right? So um, as with any team, you don't want to be too large um, and have too much, right, to the point where you're sluggish, but you also don't want to be so small that um, you can't get to all the things that, uh, that you want to do. And so really the answer to that question, I think, depends on the size of, of, of who it is that you're servicing, right? Um, 
So really, it, it needs to scale. I think from my perspective, I've, I've always found that um, seven direct reports is probably a good balance between um, having enough to keep, um, to keep you busy and aware of what's going on, but not having so little that, um, that you fall into a pattern of, of micromanagement and that sort of thing. So seven, I think for me personally, has always struck a good balance between um, being too hands-on and being too hands-off. Um, but really, the answer sort of depends on on who you're trying to servicing and service in terms of customers, and then additionally, um, you know, uh, how large is your institution? You know, obviously, your department may uh, grow or shrink over time, depending on on uh, what your organization looks like. Great, thanks, guys, and thanks so much to the audience for all your participation. Uh, before you log off, please take a moment to complete the event evaluation, which will appear on your screen in a few moments. Um, your comments and suggestions are very important to us and help us provide you with programs like this one in the future. And just as a reminder, the recertification codes for attending today will be available in the event follow-up email that will go out to you in the next couple of days. So this does conclude today's program. Have a wonderful day and you may now disconnect.